scientists have determined that there are nine habits that you do that are crushing your productivity. If you can get rid of these nine habits, then your productivity will skyrocket. That's the topic of this morning's Coffee with Colleen. So one of these nine habits is yours and you can get rid of it. Thanks for joining us. My name is Colleen Hammond. I am a former on-camera meteorologist for the Weather Channel and have been an image consultant, coach, and mentor for over 35 years. I help women take the guessing out of dressing and we work on beauty from the inside out. Today we're gonna to be talking about the inside and productivity. Bad habits are killing you. And we know about that, I talk about that all the time. Bad habits slow you down, they decrease your accuracy, they make you less creative, and they stifle your overall performance and happiness, as well as your self-esteem. Because at the end of the day, when you've had things that you've done that you've accomplished, you feel really good about yourself. So getting control of these bad habits, especially these nine that scientists have found to be the biggest offenders, will help you be happier overall and get more done. Uh, Grenville Kleiser said, by consistent self-discipline and self-control, you can develop greatness of character. So some bad habits obviously are more crushing and troublesome than others, but getting rid of any bad habit is, is really a good thing. So number one bad habit that we want to get rid of is going to be surfing the internet. And here you are on YouTube, right? But we're talking about the surfing that is unplanned. And like you're working on something and then you just reach over and you grab your phone and you start surfing the internet. It takes you 15 full minutes to get totally focused on something, 15 minutes. So that means absolutely no distractions. You start working on something 15 minutes. Now you're into what they call flow or you're in the zone. And that's where your brain is operating at its highest efficiency. So when you're in your flow or you're in the zone, scientists have shown that you're five times more productive. And anything you do to get out of that, it, co talks, it costs you basically 15 minutes to get back into it. So anytime you're like, oh, I'm not quite sure. Oh, wait a minute, I just my phone beeped. Oh, here's something, I'm gonna go check this. It's gonna take you 15 minutes of focus and concentration to get back into that highly productive state. So anytime you go away, you're causing yourself problem. Number two, is trying to get it perfect all the time, perfectionism. And actually, Brene Brown has done a lot of research. Of course, she's a shame researcher, right? She's done a lot of research on perfectionism and how really it masks our insecurities and our, our, our wanting to not be criticized by other people. So we don't want to be judged. We don't want to be blamed. We don't want other people to think less of us. And what happens is sadly our self-worth becomes tied to what other people think about us and quite frankly who, who really we shouldn't care right so when you try to make everything perfect and you could be you could have been raised in a home like I was where I come home with five A's and an A minus and in the five A's are ignored and the A minus is like what's with the A minus do I need to call your teacher what happened so then you don't want to do anything unless it's perfect so go back into your childhood, you know, look at your inner child. And as, as corny as that sounds, it's really true. Look at why you feel you need to be perfect. Why can't you release something until it's A plus work? And my business coach told me, go for C work. I'm like, I don't think I've ever gotten a C in my life. How about if I go for B work <laughs> and then release that? So as a writer, one of the examples that I love that I, I read, forget where I read this, but it talked about you know, when you're you're developing these fictional characters and you're doing all, all the anal you know analysis and you're writing all all the stuff that it's not part of the book or it's not part of the short story, it's not part or even if you're researching to write a blog post or some sort of article for Medium or whatever, you do all this research and then you've got all of this which I do this a lot. You got all this research and your brainstorm and everything. Because you know you have to research, you have to have a character development, or you need to do this research before you write about something on, on, in, a, in a column or in a blog post. Now you have all the research done, but what about getting it down on paper and getting things going as to the actual story or the actual article, the actual column? So again, it's, you can't get anything out there unless you get started, but this author said that you can edit a bad page, you just can't edit a blank page. So just get it out there and get something on paper so that you can start editing it. It's the same thing with anything you're doing. You're creating programs, you're, uh, anything that you're doing. It goes for anything that you can look at, perfectionism. Number three, meetings, communities. Let's get together and chat about this. 
meetings chew up time like nobody's business. And if you've taken any of my courses on the temperaments, you'll know that there's one temperament type that if you have this is a high uh, factor in your temperament, you're going to love meetings. And that's a sanguine. These people love people. They love friends. They love chatting. They love getting together. Uh, I'm a what they call a cleric or an ENTJ if you do Myers-Briggs or a high D if you do the DISC profile, etc. I don't like meetings. Um, I, I, it's not that I don't like people. I want to get it done. I want to just get things accomplished. So meetings, or maybe you think, do you think meetings, give me a comment below if you think comp meetings are very, very productive. I mean, they can be, but that's just it. If you go into the beginning of the meeting and say, okay, here's our agenda. These are the things we're going to be covering. We have 20 minutes for this meeting. At the end of the 20 minutes, I have something else I have to get to. Y'all can stay and chat if you want, but these are the items that we need to address. Boom, 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 over, done with, gone. So meetings can drag on forever and ever unless you set clear limits and boundaries. And we've talked about boundaries in other areas of our life too. Number four is keeping your inbox open. And then if you like ping, you've got mail. Remember when that was a thing with AOL? And it was really cool when you'd get an email. It was so new and novel. Now it's novel to get something in, you know, from snail mail. But if you keep your email program open and then you respond to emails as they come in, again, you're losing that focus. And every time you lose focus, it takes 15 minutes. Not only that, you're allowing other people to set your agenda. You're in the defense instead of being in an offensive position. So what you want is to set time aside every day that you're going to read emails. Now, what about important emails, you say? Colleen, I've got something coming in. You know what? Gmail has all sorts of the ways that you can set up priority or set it as a high priority. So so it pings on your phone if you're expecting an email from somebody that's very important, a client, your attorney, your mom, your wife, your spouse, whatever. Um, you can set those as priorities so that they will ping or show up on your phone. So set those alerts and then save the, the, save the rest for later. You'll notice if you email me, you may get a hold of my virtual assistant, Jennifer, but you won't get a hold of me in the morning before noon. I don't read emails until noon unless I have labeled you as urgent or important. So don't let other people's agendas set your agenda for the day because you're going to just be chasing rabbits all day long. So don't respond by keeping your inbox open. Keep it closed and set certain times a day where you open your inbox, respond to emails, and then shut it back down again. Number five is the snooze button. I'm not a snooze button person. I'm also not an alarm person. And the more I researched this, the more I found out why. Your brain goes through specific cycles. You have to cycle through certain things at night and then your brain also washes itself at night. Between two and four, your liver back washes. You know? So there's things that are happening in your body. This is why sleep is so important. But what happens toward the morning, toward that time that you have set on your alarm, if you use an alarm, your body knows subconsciously, have you ever woken up before the, like a couple of minutes before the alarm goes off? You are that in tune with your body and your body is that in tune with things that are around you that it will start the wake up routine for you knowing that the alarm is going off and then it doesn't want to be jarred awake. So you will wake up your body and your brain will wake you up before that alarm goes off. So there's a whole process that your body goes through to make you more alert in the morning. And when you hit the snooze button and go back to sleep, that body, that your body doesn't repeat that waking up process. So once you are up, don't hit the snooze. Oh, I need an extra nine minutes. Then plan that in the night before and set your alarm for nine minutes later because you're actually doing yourself a biological disservice. And then I make my bed every day. But what I do and what I taught my children to do is while you're in bed, you're arranging the sheets. And you can use that well Mel Robbins trick to trick your brain into reprogramming itself to get out of bed if you're having a hard time. Instead of hitting the snooze button, make your bed while you're lying in bed. And then while you're arranging your, your sheets and your blankets and everything, five, four, three, two, one, go. Now you can take for as long as you want to count that down backwards. But that counting process on your mark, get set, go is something we've all been raised with. Or if you do better as one, two, three, four, five, go, you know, that's depending on how you do it, using that process to get yourself out of bed. So your body will be groggy if you hit the snooze button because it won't be able to re-go through that wake up process. 
So don't hit the snooze button because it takes hours for the grogginess to wait wear off. Number six, multitasking. All right, I used to think I was the queen of multitasking. I had to give up my crown when I read a study by the University of Minnesota that said people who brag or think, not brag, but people who think that they're good multitaskers, they put those in tasks with other people who said, I do multitask on occasion because I have to, but I'm just not that good at it. They found that the people who claimed to be really good at multitasking were worse than the people who said they were bad multitaskers. So when you think you're really good at it, because think about it, you can't chase two rabbits at the same time. If you hold your finger up in front of your face, you can't focus and see your finger in focus at the same time that you're focused on a painting across the room that's hanging on the wall. You can only focus on one thing at a time and then jump back between the two things. And your brain uses glucose to make that jump. We're gonna talk about glucose in a minute. So you can't multitask. You can't pay attention. Your, your recall is much, much lower. You have a less capacity to perform tasks well or successfully when you're trying to do more than one thing at a time. So only do one thing, focus on it, get that 15 minutes in, get yourself in the zone, set yourself a time limit, you know, that jobs will expand to fill the time that you have allotted for them. So if you know it's gonna take you an hour to get something done, set your timer for 50 minutes. And then that timer goes off, you know you got five or 10 minutes to wrap it up. Of course, that's probably a bad idea because it takes 15 minutes to get into focus, but that's what I do. <laughs> and I normally try to beat that 50 minute mark because I can see it coming up on the clock anyway. Um, so really trying to take a job and get it done in the shortest amount of time possible. And if you need an extra time, you know, your brain really focuses best on 50 minute chunks or 45 to an hour. Some people a little bit less. You have to train your brain into focusing for longer amounts of time. Um, but really trying to focus on one thing at a time and getting that one thing done before you move on to the next. The number seven bad habit is delaying tough tasks. And I love Brian Tracy's book, Eat the Frog. You have a limited amount of mental energy. It goes back to glucose. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, but when we exhaust that brain energy, our de decision-making abilities and our productivity just bottom out rapidly. And that's called decision fatigue. That's why it's so important to have good habits built into your life. Have you ever driven someplace that you go to all the time and you get there and you go, how did I get here? I don't even remember driving here because you kind of did it on autopilot. The more things you can put on autopilot during your day, the better off you will be because you will have more brain power for important things. That's why as much as you can determine the night before for your morning routine, you know, laying out your clothes that you're going to wear so that you don't have to get up in the morning and try to decide what to wear. Deciding the night before what you're going to have for breakfast the next morning, doing meal plans for the whole week is even better because then it's done for the week. You never have to think about it. You know, when you get up, what things need to be taken out of the freezer to thaw or what's going to be done. So as more, the more that you can do the night before when you're still awake and you still have some glucose in your brain left over for making those decisions, the better off you'll be. So you don't need to decide what earrings to wear. Do I wear these earrings or these earrings? You know, they're just set out and they're ready to go. So when you put off put doing those tasks, so in the morning, you wake up, you go through your routine, you have something to eat, and now your body has glucose to burn because you have to break the fast because you've been fasting all night. You break the fast, thus a breakfast, and you provide your body with the glucose and the brain needs to make decisions. And when you run out of that glucose is when you run into decision fatigue. So the sooner you can do that tough task and get it out of the way, the better off you are because now you're dealing with your brain at its top point of the day. Uh, that's why they say get surgeries first thing in the morning because the surgeon has just had breakfast, he's awake, he's focused, and that's going to be his best surgery of the day because he has more energy, mental energy, to make those important decisions during that surgery. Wednesdays is also the most optimal day. So also what happens is when you, you're kind of dreading doing that horrible task, it's kind of running on a tape in the back of your head. It's just kind of this little player going in the back of your head. And that uses mental energy because it's back there and you're constantly thinking about it. So if there is a tough job that needs to be done or something you don't want to do, don't delay it. Do it first. Number eight, 
any devices after dinner, your phone, your tablet, your computer, your television set. Now they're saying the television set isn't that big of a deal because you're far enough away from it, but, but still emitting those jaggedy lights. So they used to say an hour before bed, get, a, get rid of anything that emits a blue light. So your phones, tablets, computers, even television. And then they said two hours before bedtime. Now they're saying sundown. And let me tell you why. When you get up in the morning, it's important to get outside and get natural sunlight in your eyeballs. Why? Because of the angle of the sun and how it cuts through the atmosphere, there's more blue light from the sun in the morning than at any other time of the day. So blue light isn't the bad guy, it's when you're getting it. So what happens when you get blue light? It hits the back of your eye and it triggers your brain to stop producing melatonin. Now, if you're familiar with sleep problems, you know about valerian and melatonin and tryptophan and all that stuff, right? Um, chamomile, uh, lavender, whatever. But melatonin is something your body produces naturally to help you wind down. So when you get blue sunlight in the morning, it tells your brain, stop it with the melatonin, which increases your alertness because now you don't have that groggy melatonin going on. So preferably get outside. Now you're going to get blue light from your phone too, but uh, you get better blue light from the sun. Then as the sun goes through its cycle throughout the day, it filters through the atmosphere differently, which causes less blue light. So you're getting less blue light as the day goes on until the sun goes down at night. So as that blue light decreases during the day, your body's like, oh, wait a minute, I need to start thinking about producing melatonin here. Let me trickle out some melatonin. Let me trickle out a little bit more. So by the time the sun goes down, your body goes time and starts producing melatonin in earnest which is why if you're using anything with a blue light on it, like your phone, your computer, your tablet, your television, it's telling your body to stop producing melatonin. Sure, you can take it, but the body produces the best melatonin. It doesn't come from a pill. So that short wavelength blue light will shut down the melatonin production in your body. So by the evening time, after dinner. Now they're saying that television isn't as bad because you're far enough away from it, but you're still getting the, the repeated images, right? So avoid any of those uh, devices after dinner. That's a tough one. And finally, number nine, not this, not the full screen. Here we are. Number nine, sugar. This is one I really wanted to talk about eating too much sugar. So the thing is your body needs sugar. It needs glucose. So let's talk about glucose because your body will convert things into its usable form in the body, which is glucose. The easy way to convert it is sugar, just plain processed sugar, and that will immediately convert to the glucose in your body. A little bit harder to convert would be fructose, which comes from fruit, <laughs> that's the name. So you've got that, but that still is digested very rapidly in your body. It only takes like 15 to 20 minutes to digest a piece of fruit, which is why it's important to eat fruit on an empty stomach. Um, whole nother story, but better off than it will be that will convert to the glucose, but your glucose rather, but you are better off complex carbohydrates. Why? Because it takes the body longer to process those and convert those into glucose. So if you want energy for your brain, your brain needs glucose. And the best way to get that is from complex carbohydrates. Too little glucose, you feel tired, unfocused, groggy, too much makes you jittery and unable to focus and get in the zone. So there is that sweet spot and scientists have determined that about 25 grams of glucose a day is what your body needs to operate an optimum level. So you want to space that out a little bit in the morning, a little bit at lunch, actually probably more at lunch because you get that afternoon nap time, right? Uh, and then just a little bit at dinner. So you want the majority of your glucose to be at breakfast and lunch because you're not going to need as much brain power at night uh, unless you work at night. So just thinking about the times of day where you need more brain power, those are the days that you really want, or times of days rather, that you want to consume your complex carbohydrates. So remember that your refined and processed sugars will lead to a boost for about 20 minutes. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes to digest a piece of fruit, and then you get about 20 minutes of, you know, that's not fruit, but it takes 20 minutes to digest the fruit, but it gives you a little bit longer but the more complex your carbohydrates. So think first, of course, of greens, your rich greens like kale. Kale is loaded with carbs. I think in a cup of kale, it's six grams of carbs, where romaine, I think, has like point 
five grams of carbs. So those light, rich greens are going to give you a lot of carbohydrates. Proce uh, not processed wheat, but not wheat. What am I thinking of? Rice. You don't want white rice. You want brown rice. You want quinoa. Anything that's more complex that takes your body longer to digest, break down, and convert into glucose it will allow you to have that glucose for a longer time during the day, which will give you more energy because it's released slowly and enables you to sustain your focus. So some of these habits are minor, um, but the little things add up. So think about it. The worst habit is losing track of what really matters in your life. So that's not included in those nine, but look through those nine and tell me in the comment section below, which one of those habits are you going to focus on first? And if this is something you enjoy, then give me some ideas of other, other topics that you would like to see included um, because productivity, anything about developing your inner self as well as your outer self, because of course I am an image consultant, uh, but we work on the, the total person. So we work from the inside out, we work on body language, and then we also work on your image and what you wear. So make sure that you subscribe if you're not subscribed already and click that bell so that you are notified the next time I go live. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Bye.